Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, braving the snow, <laughs> or the cold, to join us today. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies uh, here, and uh, we're really glad to have you all here for what we hope will be a very uh, interesting and engaging discussion on how to think about uh, China's economy and uh, what's happening. I'm just back from China myself, and certainly uh, my impression was that uh, a lot more pessimism uh, with regard to where the economy is and uh, its prospects. Uh, people becoming concerned that the traditional tools that the uh, regime uses to keep the economy going um, aren't having the intended effects, and so on. And then just some real concerns that a lot of the numbers uh, are looking very negative and, and not looking to turn around anytime soon. So we have a very distinguished panel uh, with us today. Uh, Ann Stevenson Young, uh, who co-founded J Capital Research in late 2007 and is the firm's research director. Uh, her cover areas include solar, internet, medical devices, property, uh, some consumer and direct sales, and China's macro economy. Anne was formerly co-founder of a group of online media businesses called Blue Bamboo Ventures, and also founded and operated a CRM software company. Uh, Clarity Data Systems, and a publishing company whose flagship magazine is City Weekend. Over 25 years in China, Anne has also worked as an industry analyst and trade advocate, heading the U.S. Information Technology Office, and uh, 1993 to 97, the China operations of the U.S. China Business Council, so obviously deep, deep expertise. Uh, Bob Davis is a senior editor of the Wall Street Journal, uh, who uh, economic and other issues in the 2016 presidential campaign from 2011 to 2014, he covered the Chinese economy from Beijing uh, and still misses China despite the pollution. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Deborah Bruno, are writing a book uh, on their experiences in the country, which will be published by the journal. Until October 2011, he was international economics correspondent in Washington, D.C. And from 2004 to 2011, he was the journal's Latin America bureau chief. Uh, and then from 2002 to 2004, he was the Washington, D.C. news editor responsible for coverage of economic policy making. Uh, and then Scott Kennedy, uh, deputy director here in the Freeman Chair and uh, the head of our new program on uh, Chinese business and political economy at CSIS. Uh, Scott is a leading authority on China's economic policy and its global economic relations. Uh, specific areas of focus for Scott include industrial policy, business lobbying, multinational business challenges in China, Chinese participation in global economic regimes and philanthropy. And for over 14 years before joining us here at CSIS, Scott was a professor at Indiana University and prior to uh, was director of the Research Center for Chinese Politics and Business, and he was founding academic director of IU's China office. So with that, uh, I think, Anne, we're going to turn it over to you for your presentation. Oh, really? I'm first. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I'm not we'll sure go for I'm ready that. for that. But, um, well, thank you. Um, I'll just sit here if that's okay. Yes, um, please. Because I, I, I would really like to, uh, to, to make this a, a discussion and an exchange rather than a presentation, but let me try to set some of the, oh, can I change, can I like move these? We could bring the mobile, or, uh, that's a mobile. You can just bring that over <coughs> to your lap if you'd like. Bring what over to my lap? Is that, does that come over? I don't know what that is. I think oh, that that, oh, a keyboard. The keyboard. Yeah, yeah, they still have these for some reason. Okay. Well, there you go. Okay. I mean, it would be boring to go through anyway, but probably I will forget otherwise what I'm going to talk about. So we'll see whether this kind of works one way or the other. No. Anyway, we'll figure that out. Um, what do you think? Enter. Yes. Enter. Did, did, did that not work? Enter. Done yet? No. There we oh, go. There we go. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, and I, I must have gotten some flash going there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that. Okay, so here's the way that I'd, I'd like to set the sort of framework of discussion. I find in, in my work that the attitude toward China internationally has shifted very dramatically over the last two years. <clears throat> and now the people I talk to, mostly the people I talk to are in money management. So they're in money management in the US and Europe, but also in you know, politics and other areas. And I find that, that now the, dis, the, the scope or the, um, the, the spectrum of discussion is, is China going to have a financial crisis soon? Or it, are, do we have two years of muddling through and is China sort of turning into Japan? That's the range of discussion now. The discussion is, doesn't even include, oh, well, is China, you know, China is, is expanding and whatever problems it's getting through and the consumer is becoming more important and it's economically important, that stuff is gone. 
Also, all the, um, the, the, the number of times I was asked uh, in the pre-2012 period to be on panels about innovation and Chinese technology was really, you know, I, I, I honestly would rather have a root canal than go talk about that again. It was just a huge topic of discussion disappeared. Now, it may be that people are sick of me, but which is also probably the case, but I think also the topic has dwindled in importance because it's become clear that Chinese technology is not projecting into the international world anymore as the financing for technology and other industries falls. So um, what I'd like to start with is why does debt really matter? Um, so debt in China, we can all agree, is, is, very, is enormous. Uh, there's a range of estimates for the size of debt compared with GDP. There's discussion about the size of debt. How much is double counting? There's discussion about the size of GDP. But I think we can pretty much all agree that it's in the range of 200 to 300% of, of uh, GDP. Uh, outstanding loans from the banks, outstanding loans from the shadow banks, uh, and, and other elements of debt. So why does this matter? Because the, the economic, let's say that the average interest rate on debt is about 7%. Right now, the, the long-term benchmark rate is 6.15. Uh, the, the shadow banks charge upwards of 10%. So if you average it out, it might be you know 6 or 7%. Um, so if you triple that, that means you have to get 18 to 20 percent GDP real growth every year just to cover the debt. And clearly that's not happening. And so if that doesn't happen, then either you have to write off debt or you have to, um, you know, you, you have to come to some sort of, it's kind of odd how it's flashing. Is it coming out up there? I guess it doesn't matter. Um, so you have to, you, you, you have to come to some, you know, some resolution of that. You have to write off debt, or you have to, you know, do something about it. Um, so, uh, so what the authorities have been doing? I think the fundamental problem for the authorities <coughs> is that the, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of debt being written off and being being moved over to asset management companies or being quietly negotiated down. Um, but it's nowhere near enough. Um, and, and right now, servicing debt is consuming virtually all the credit resources in the economy. So this, um, this makes it very difficult for, uh, for anybody else, you know, people to get, get credit or get, get, uh, get capital in order to build new capacity. There's also the problem that new capacity is not really in demand. But, uh, yeah. but right now you have a situation, I would say going on now for about two years, where you have uh, almost a zombie economy effect, where, where you have virtually all the credit in the economy being issued to roll over old debt, uh, very, very low uh, credit, credit demand in the rest of the economy, uh, declining prices, particularly from manufacturers, an excess of, of commodities, excess of production, and very low demand. So that's the situation we're in right now. Um, growth in the economy, I would put, we don't do independent uh, macroeconomic forecasting because the data set is too difficult to work with. Um, so we use the, the, all the different data sets out of, out of China all the time and we do primary research to triangulate and on a kind of Anecdotal basis uh, growth in the in the economy would be a little bit sub-zero this quarter. You don't want to call it a recession because you don't necessarily have several quarters in a row that are sub-zero. But there's there's no way the economy is growing much right now. Um, if you look at the simplest the simplest metrics, even for last year, leaving leaving aside this quarter, and you always sort of drop into a data hole in the first quarter because of Spring Festival. Um, but even looking at last year, we had domestic steel demand down by about 5%. We had, um, depending on how you read the statistics, but our point of view is that, that cement demand dropped by about 1% to 2%. It went negative last August. Uh, freight and, and electric power appeared to go negative in May and not really recover. Uh, there were, you know, basically all the industrial economy started to gear down and go uh, tip negative around about May last year. It's very hard to come out to 
the, the, the financial services industry grew. I would argue that the consumer industry did not grow, but that's a very controversial point of view. Whichever way you, you calculate, you come to a very low level of growth, uh, definitely negative in the current quarter. So, oops, I seem to have lost, there we go. So we have a situation now where we have a very kind of um, uh, depressed economy, not in the technical sense, but a kind of low depressed economy, and we have massive overcapacity in industry. So, for example, petrochemicals is an industry that I looked at pretty carefully a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, two years ago, it was already running at about 65% capacity. Uh, construction machinery is one that I know very, fairly well. That was running at 50% uh, uh, production capacity about a year ago. Steel is at around, it's gone from 85 to about 65, 70. Um, so in, in major, major portions of the economy, cement also is, is, is certainly under 80% major portions of the economy, you have massive, massive overcapacity. Clearly, it will take years of growth to fill up that capacity. So you have on one hand, and these are just exemplars of those issues, um, you, have, you have massive overcapacity, declining and probably negative growth. Um, and so more and more difficulty filling up that capacity adding to this phenomenon of very low loan demand and, uh, and very sort of low demand in the economy. Aluminum is a, is a case that I just thought I'd lay out for you because you have this, this um, contrast between, uh, between the need of the, of, of the governments to create growth through production targets and the actual you know, demand in the economy. So, uh, you know, one, one sort of aside comment that I might make, because I'm sure to some of you these, you know, the idea that China is growing negatively is very shocking and you, know, <coughs> you, you don't agree with that, but I, 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 would, I would submit that the GDP number out of China is not a calculated result of data, but instead a production target. And I think that most in the central government would agree with that point of view. Um, the, the production target is provided because <coughs> The principal owner of state industry, SASAC, is the approver of all budgets for state, state uh, enterprises, and budgets are made according to a very rigid formula, which is essentially GDP growth times this particular industry's historical proportion of GDP growth, or growth against GDP, X times Y equals Z, that's your target for the year. So if the government were to say, actually, GDP grew at 3% last year, and I think it'll grow at 1.8% this year. That sends a signal throughout state industry that your production target is now, if you're steel and you've traditionally grown at one point above GDP, then it would be 2.8. And that, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you can't do that. So um, the consumer sector I can spend time on if anybody cares about it, but I believe that the consumer sector actually is tracking close to zero as well. Um, the, the number out of the NBS is the worst number that we have. Um, what, what we do more commonly is just look at all the results on the A-share exchange. You have about, I don't know, 160 or so companies in cons consumer industries that are listed there. If you simply aggregate all of their revenue, you clear out the companies that didn't exist last quarter or do exist this quarter or disappeared this quarter, whatever, you come to negative growth uh, in gross revenue of 2% at mid-year last year of 6% in the third quarter. And that's not even clearing out uh, <coughs> investment-driven growth in acquisitions and mergers. So, so I think it's pretty clear that if the strongest consumer companies in China are seeing a, a decline in gross revenue, then the consumer industry is not in good shape. Am I going too slow? No. Okay. I think you're on target. All right. So, um, as we all know, property is somewhere on the order of 20% of the economy, depending on which portions of property you count. And property has been uh, tracking negative for some time. Sales of property are negative. Prices of property, hard to say. Right now, the indices that are provided are, are negative on pricing. Um, and construction, construction completions last year 
went up and the amount of property in the chain went up because there's a huge, huge sort of, there's a python effect or there's a pig in a python effect. But, um, but starts last year were regularly declined and declined quite sharply and I think we'll see construction down this year. If steel dropped about 4.8% last year, this is not netting out the exports, but domestic steel demand dropped about 4.8%. This year it will be down at least 10%. So um, that's good for the environment, but bad for materials. Uh, these are just a few, like, you know, a few tourist shots from my cell phone about overcapacity in housing to try to drive, I think to this audience, we don't really need to dwell on it but um, to an, a less sophisticated audience exposed to China, um, the, you really need to bring home the point that, it, that the overcapacity in housing is absolutely ubiquitous. It's, it's actually obscene. It's, you, you can't, and I've done things like you know, drive down the highway and randomly get off at exits and, and go talking to the local districts and ask them how much housing they have on sale. I've been to cities, you know, the city of um, Yinchuan and Ningxia, where 60% where of the population works for the state and has allocated housing, they had, the last, last time I visited about 18 months ago, they had 1.2 million units on the market ready for sale. That's not counting sold but idle housing. Uh, and the population of the city is something on the order of 1.2 million. Uh, this is, and you know, that's, that's at the peak of the U.S. market, I believe we sold 1.2 million new homes nationally. So this is the degree of, uh, of excess uh, right now in China. As I point out here, there are roughly 70 million units of new housing in the construction chain right now. Clearly, you can't bring all of those to completion. That's going to be very serious for the construction companies. So, Many might say, okay, this has happened before, so why is it serious now? And I think that the simple answer is that we're, we've reached our debt limit now. And there are various ways of showing that. And um, the reason that I think that we've, that we've reached, the, the one critical reason that we've reached our debt limit in China is that you no longer have the free lunch of QE3 and sort of free or you know, interest-free interest money circulating internationally <coughs> that's attracted into, into China for the carry rates that are being offered in the, uh, in the property industry there. Uh, you don't have the same inflow of money, and therefore it's much more difficult to finance these things without simply uh, printing fake money. So uh, this is, uh, I probably should have put this elsewhere, but this is simply to support my point about, um, about retail and the consumer. Uh, you do get, I don't know how to go backwards on this, but um, you do get statistics out of the NBS that consistently show 12 to uh, sort of 11 to 13 percent growth every year, every month, every year over the last 20 or so in retail, but you need to take out of those statistics unsold inventories and government procurement, which includes construction materials, which is double counting. Um, you do have series out of the government that are more, uh, I believe, more reflective of reality. There's a unit under, which used to be part of the old Ministry of Internal Trade, which gives you a series that's it's pretty, it shows much more fluctuation and volatility, but it certainly is very different from uh, that provided by, by the NBS, and that shows you the comparison of the two only through the first half of last year. Um, so this is the part about uh, consumer companies uh, on uh, Shanghai Exchange. Um, and this is another thing that's important for the finance world, probably not so important for you, but it's the e-commerce world, this, you know, all, we've got a lot of information from Alibaba, JD.com, VIP Shop, and so forth, because they've recently listed in the United States and have become, uh, you know, are, are issuing a lot of information about the, the surging growth of these industries. My brief point of view on this, this industry is that it's actually it's banking, it's not sale of goods. There is sale of goods going over these networks. The sale of goods is rising, 
Uh, it's, it's generally occurring at a negative gross margin. Uh, it will decline again, and it's, uh, it's investment driven, but the key uh, motivation of these companies, Tencent, uh, Net, NetEase to the extent that it has it, Alibaba, JD.com, and so forth, is their ability to aggregate capital through the payment systems that they control uh, and the ability to move that capital into investment vehicles. And that's what's the core value of those companies, both to those companies and to the regulators, but it doesn't reflect an underlying growth in consumption. Um, so what's going to happen? Um, I think that it's worth pausing for a moment to, talk, to think about some of the social ramifications of this, uh, of, of the property explosion and the property bust that's, that's really been underway uh, for the last year or so, since the Hangzhou uh, decline of, of last February. Um, you have a situation, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great misunderstanding, I think, in the international world of what urbanization means. Um, people here, you know, because we use this term to apply to developing countries around the world, we think of it as rural people moving to urban areas and becoming urban people. It's not at all what it is in China. Urbanization in China is urbanization in situ. It's, it's a local government that owns rural land that has incentives to change the bureaucratic designation of that land to urban through uh, an ag you know, making the population denser, through a certain level of investment, through a you know, number of other things. The local people have strong interest in becoming urban people because they get better access to schools, hospitals, and so forth. Uh, so there's, there's a great confluence of interest in over-investing in rural land and building what essentially tend to be useless, um, oh, I made it bigger again. Um, you, you know, here are a couple of things from my cell phone. Again, an LED park that used to be an orange grove in Guangdong totally deserted now, but absorbed well over a billion US dollars in capital investment. Um, a, a logistics port in Taizhou, in uh, that's Zhejiang Taizhou or Jiangsu Taizhou, I forget. Jiangsu, Zhejiang has one too, right? Anyway, this one, I, I like this one because I was actually chased by a mob. <laughs> because I had a meeting with the, with the local LGF, LGFV official who was in charge of developing this, and he was the one who cleared the, the, the people who had been growing citrus in this area <laughs> and built this logistics port. It turns out there's absolutely no need for inland coal logistics. And they even built the docks to the wrong standard so they couldn't get deep draft ships, and it was just, it's just a disaster. So the people had been paid, but because of the particular type of bureaucratic designation, they had to buy houses in the new district if they, if they were to have houses. They were incensed. When I arrived to meet the guy, there were all these people running around yelling, but it was in Zhejiangua, it was in like Minanhua, or something. not Minanhua, but some kind of Zhejiang dialect, and I couldn't follow it, so I wasn't paying attention. So you know, I call the official I'm supposed to meet, and he says, I'm downstairs, come beat me by the elevator. <laughs> so I go downstairs, the mob like runs down the stairs, and I'm taking the elevator. I get down, and he's here, come over here. So I like jog, and the mob follows us. We get in his car, slam the doors, and they throw themselves on the hood, and he drives off because they're looking for compensation. And this is a, a situation that you find all over the country. Hmm. So, you have you know, a country filled with these model cities, model shopping centers, and you know, logistics parks and things like that, which are really totally you know, unutilized and um, you know, changing the complexion of Chinese society. Um, let me uh, just move on quickly to, uh, to less of the disaster stuff. Um, so, why is it building to a crisis right now? Um, I think that the, the, that the simple reason is just because we've gotten to a point where so much credit is going to keep, keep everything rolling over uh, because of the concern of what will happen politically if, some, if this debt is recognized following sort of the daisy chain of, um, of relatedness and of um, you know, obligation with, because there's so much because of the importance of the shadow sector, which until 
mid last year was about 55% of funding. Uh, nobody really has a good grip on who owns all that debt. And so allowing debt instruments to go belly up uh, can create this chain of consequences that any government would be terrified to, to identify or to, you know, to be confronted with. And therefore, you keep everything rolling over. Right now, the amount of capital that's required to keep it rolling over has reached a, a dangerous level. We're putting about 1.2 trillion renminbi into the system every day just to keep the banks, uh, the banks liquid. And that creates all sorts of opportunities for failure. Um, as, as I think you know, the central government uh, has faced capital flight now for the first time in a long time. We had a net reduction <coughs> of uh, 91 billion US dollars in, in, uh, in, in reserves last year. Uh, there was a, a, a capital flight of about 150 billion dollars in the second half. Um, and <coughs> this is, you would think, with 3.8 trillion, <coughs> so they say, um, it would be not of such great concern. I think there are a couple of issues there. One issue is that many of those reserves are not so liquid. They're out in things like, you know, debt to Venezuela. And so, you know, it's of, of great concern to them. And also, it's accelerating, as you see from the pressure on the, uh, on the exchange rate. So this is a key break point. Um, I think that the corruption, the anti-corruption campaigns are something that we need to consider as part of this whole complex of, of, uh, of economic issues. I think that the political system, fundamentally any political system's ultimate need is to provide its own network of, of critical supporters with resources. And when resources in society, the Jiang Zemin era created uh, network capital at a phenomenal level and higher and higher expectations of how much network capital would be available to the elite. So it became like, like Silicon Valley, you know, well, Chinese's grandson made a billion dollars, well, I'm way better than he is, why shouldn't I? So when you start growing at a lower rate and not having so many uh, resources to provide to the network, what you need to do is arrogate their capital to your network. And I think that's the simple way that we should understand the anti-corruption event. Um, so what's next? Is it going to be a sharp decline, interbank defaults, as we saw in 2013, um, and a quick devaluation? I expect there will be a devaluation. I don't know about the defaults. I think there will be further corruption attacks on the banks and brokerages, and particularly uh, casinos and other channels, you know, Chennai District and Shenzhen other channels for exiting money. And I think we'll, we'll see a continued closing of the country to foreign influences. Um, so, so this is basically the range of the debate now. Is it, does it go out with a bang or with a whimper? Do we see continued long deflationary bust with, uh, with no growth or negative growth until slowly, slowly, slowly you start to fill up that capacity and write it off? Or do we see a bust? So that's about it. Okay. Great, thank you very much, that's good. Um, Bob, I think we're gonna have you chime in. Okay, um, given that, I'd like to say something optimistic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll sort of try. Um, uh, and you know, his work is always really interesting and provocative. Uh, when I was in China, I was always really impressed by her and her colleagues. Um, uh, ability to go out into the field and see things um, because China is so difficult to understand and and if you get around at least you have a better shot at it but it's it's such a diverse place um, but okay so here's some critiques of, um, of what Anne said so um, to start off uh, Anne was talking about uh, GDP to debt ratio between 200 and 300 percent that's a hell of a range um, 200 percent, which is, I think, basically the generally accepted uh, view of uh, what the, the uh, GDP to debt ratio is, um, to get another 100 percent, just to throw it on there, I mean, it added nine percentage points last year. So that's 10 more years before you get to 300 percent. Um, I also think that Anne's um, presentation was heavily dependent on the sort of SOE view of the economy. That's a 
a portion of the economy, an incredibly important portion, but, but uh, we have Nick Lardy in the front row um, who's written extensively on sort of the diminishing uh, importance of the SOE. Um, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the presentation also um, is a critique, which <laughs> everybody who's in China looks at China, criticizes the government stats. I mean, I don't believe they're growing at 7.4% either, but it's so easy to cherry pick. Okay, so we don't believe 7.4%, but how come we do believe the cement stats or we believe the steel stats or whatever, you know, most they, all of the stats that we depend on are produced by the government. So how come we depend on some, but we don't depend on others? And how come the ones that we depend on are the ones that make things look really bad? Um, I think the chances that China is growing negative are astonishingly slow, uh, small. I mean, I think if, if China was really not growing at 7.4 percent, but it but it negative, I think you'd have huge unemployment that would be impossible to, um, to hide. The only time that we, the, the unemployment of all the stats, the unemployment stats are the worst. I mean, it's 4.1% unemployment every quarter, um, <laughs> even during the global recession. But during the global recession, you saw millions of people going back from Shenzhen. You could go to, tra I mean, I wasn't there, but people who were there tell me you can go to train stations and see you know, people lining up. You don't see that. There, may be, there are people going back, it's certainly true. There are people going back to their home uh, provinces, and that's, uh, I think, you know, probably mostly because there's a little more opportunity there. But if you're in Shenzhen or Guangzhou, the problem is not that they have too many workers, it's the opposite still. So how does that square? Um, so I think, I do agree, I mean, the way I look at it is 7.4, whatever the number is, this is China as it is. I, I totally agree with Anne's way of looking at things, of looking at, at corporations whose stats that you, whose reporting you believe to be more accurate um, because they're under SEC mandates or whatever. And so this is China as it is. Things are clearly slowing. Um, there's no reason to think that McDonald's or, or P&G have all of a sudden lost out in a fight uh, with whatever the local, um, uh, the Chinese company is. And you know, their sales are flat. So I mean, something clearly is slowing, slowing substantially. Um, and I think also uh, the usual answer for all this, I think the government's usual answer for all this is, you know, we recognize there's problems, we're gonna reform, we're gonna change the sort of basis of the of the way the society, um, the way the economy operates. I think there's precious little evidence that that has occurred so far. Um, I think slower growth, slower official growth is not evidence of, uh, of reform. It's just evidence of things slowing. Um, and um, uh, what was I thinking of? Oh, and that the, um, uh, I think uh, one thing that uh, Anne pointed to a little bit, I think has actually a bigger negative effect. I think the anti-corruption drive is vastly underrated in terms of how much it's slowing the economy. I think uh, what's happening, I don't know how to show it in the stats, is some story I never got to, but, <laughs> but the idea, I mean, the positive way of looking at the anti-corruption drive is that uh, you know, she is taking on very powerful interests and many of them are at the SOEs, and so when they finally turn to SOE reform, who in the world is ever gonna oppose them? Possible, it'll happen. Um, but the negative, which I think is the case, is that he scared people to death, and that uh, bureaucrats are just afraid to approve projects because they either might be on the take or could be accused of being on the take, and that it's added to a sort of general ennui among sort of the, the government and business class, and it's hard to see how they end it. Um, and I, th I assume that, they th that it surprised them too. It being the depth of the corruption has surprised the officials that got into it. I don't think they thought it would be this deep and, and take uh, that much time. So um, let me just sort of end uh, by the way, I, I mean, I agree also that the, you know, that there is certainly a debt squeeze of some proportion here, and that the numbers don't work out, <laughs> they just don't work out. The way, I don't see why 
this year or next year. It should be any different than three years ago. I think the government has vast resources. I don't see why they can't keep the system operating pretty much the way it's been operating. Um, in terms of keeping companies from going bankrupt and, and uh, you know, printing money or however they get, need to get the money uh, to keep the system operating. But I think what we're seeing is sort of the way I think about it is sort of sand in the gears. The things are slowing and they're slowing more and they're slowing faster than the government uh, either acknowledges or um, expects. So I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Can I have the keyboard? Yep. Sure. Super. I think what I'll do is I'll... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. Put that guy there. Uh, <clears throat> Terrific. Um, I've really enjoyed the, the discussion so far. Um, and I was kind of an instigator to, to try and put this, this uh, panel together um, because there's just been this long-term debate um, about China's economic and political trajectory. Um, and the debate isn't, doesn't only occur when China's growing fast, it also occurs when it's growing slow. Um, and there's been long-term discussion, you know, is this sustainable? Um, and instead of having greater consensus, we get a hardening positions over the years, uh, even though in some ways over the very short term uh, about you know, what's going to happen this year, the range of predictions has been relatively narrow. I've just put up uh, some of the estimates uh, <coughs> that these various organizations made uh, either in December or January. Um, and they're not hugely far apart, uh, but of course, uh, Anne is one of the people I respect most who follows China. I've known her for uh, 20 plus years now. And uh, she was at, when she was at the US China Business Council, she was actually the editor of the first article I ever published, <laughs> which was on the Stone Group, uh, which has declined uh, precipitously and will never recover. <laughs> I'm a, a great article. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's been all downhill since um, for me and Stone, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I've always, uh, and, you know, and, and in talking to Anne over the years, you know, she's one of the most keen observers. She is the one who goes out to the provinces, to the towns, who stays in the horrible hotels, who gets chased by mobs. <laughs> um, and, and so you, you have to take that seriously, extremely seriously. Uh, and she's been very successful in her career. And so there's, there's a, a good record there. Uh, and, and so, but uh, a lot of times I find when I talk to, to folks who have a different take, it seems like there's some type of, of people talking past each other every so often. And so uh, in, to some extent, it's like Chinese crosstalk where you never get a debate resolved. Um, but I always thought, I, I wanted it to be more like pro wrestling. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to, I was thinking I would love to have an event which is sort of a optimist, pessimist, ch China smackdown. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but, but, you know, Ann's probably not a great wrestler, and, and, and Bob, I wouldn't want to force him to wrestle either, but I do want to wrestle over the issues, and, and um, you know, I don't ha have a specific point of view on this, but I, uh, you know, how is, is, are we in the midst of a hard landing? Is this uh, going to, is the economy going to crash and burn? Uh, but I, what I thought I would do um, is say a, a little bit about what I think the sources of the disagreement are. Uh, and to some extent, it's posing a question to both Ann and Bob. Uh, but it's also highlighting that there is this, is, is this big debate that, that still exists. Um, and here I've listed what I think are the key differences of opinion uh, or sources of, of the uh, debate. And the first you know, um, I, I don't want to go into a scholarly exercise based you know, on my experience at Indiana University for 14 plus years. You all don't, don't need that. But there is differences of opinion about uh, the, the role of the state and development. Um, and those who tend to be more pessimistic about China tend to think that the state's role uh, needs to be quite limited and narrow, uh, and that uh, government intervention usually leads to uh, misappropriation of resources. Um, and they tend to look down on IP theft, pollution, a closed media, a lack of democracy. 
Um, and you know, there's another school of thought that looks at development that's, that says states in the development process need to intervene. Um, and they're not so concerned about corruption and IP theft and pollution, that these are all things which are part of actually fostering development in, some, in many countries, and that once you develop, these are things which, which aren't, uh, that you don't want to continue. Um, the other area where there's a big intellectual divide is the type of data. Uh, and this is a more important point, and we heard about this uh, from the presentation. Um, you know, those, uh, those who take a more negative or dour look at the economy and, and its future possibilities are very skeptical of, any, of, of most macro data. And they take a micro view look of China. They travel and look for what tangible things they can put their hands around and particularly focus on those physical measures. Um, these are the things uh, which Tom Rowski in the late 90s pointed out uh, in 1998 that he thought China was in a recession because he looked at these things, uh, made the Chinese government very unhappy with him. But these are the things which are now part of the Li Keqiang index as well. Uh, so I guess they apologized without apologizing uh, or, or appropriated. Another, another IP theft uh, that, you know, I don't know if Tom is, is going to file a suit on that, but he might. Um, on the other hand, there are those who, who, who prefer a macro view because looking at these specific measures or going to specific towns seems too anecdotal. And so turning off the highway randomly it may provide you some insight, but uh, those who take a macro view would want a more systematic. They'd say, choose 10 highways to turn off, and maybe you've done that. But um, the, macro, the folks that look at the macro data view uh, think that you need some systematic uh, way to look at data and, and you're trying to look at trends over time and that the incentive for the government, if it is to be biased, ought to be consistently biased rather than randomly biased and therefore you ought to, these trends are more important than the absolute numbers. And so these intellectual differences translate into substantive disagreements. Um, the, in terms of the size of the economy, um, you know, uh, Anne has talked about, you know, how overstated it is uh, due to the inventory buildup and, and uh, deals which are based on patronage networks uh, and the overstatement of consumption. Um, on the other side, the folks who are more uh, uh, optimistic or at least cautiously optimistic have been pointing to the, the efforts by the National Bureau of Statistics who have gone back and redone the numbers and think the economy is actually larger than they originally estimated and put forth a whole new range of data. Um, I know Dan Rosen uh, at the Rhodium Group has also done his own looking and is coming out with figures that aren't as uh, large a change from the, uh, the NBS numbers. I think actually we're gonna be pre he's going to be presenting here some of that, those findings uh, in a few weeks. Um, in terms of the questions about debt, um, you know, um, I guess the, the most negative view is that essentially what we have is a pyramid scheme economy. That um, debt is just being rolled over and pushed out the door uh, or in growing just to keep the whole system uh, on life support. Um, and of course, and, and Bob talked about the other perspe perspective. Uh, it does depend on how high you say it is. Um, and that um, one person's pyramid scheme is another person's financial deepening essentially, that you develop new types of products, uh, and China has, is, doesn't have a very deep financial system now, so developing more products, in, if, it, it, I guess it all turns on, do you think that these uh, debts will eventually go bad, or they will have some productive use in the future, and China's economic model has been, build it and they will come. And then the question is, will they build it and eventually come? And Anne's view, they may eventually come, but it will be too, too late for them to come and, and to use these things. The, the debt numbers, I've got one th uh, a couple things here on debt that come from, I think they're partly the study that, that Anne cites. Uh, they, they round off, this is from McKinsey Global Institute. Uh, their report that just came out puts debt to GDP at 282%. Uh, she just rounded up 2.8 to 3, 300 or so. Um, and you can see that, yes, China's debt is very high, but there are other countries that are not in crisis who also have quite high, high debt. I'll go to another uh, table that they have in the report. China ranks 22nd 
in this report, in terms of total debt to GDP ratio, a slightly different type of calculation that they made. Um, but 300% um, could be manageable if the United States and others can continue to grow. I think the calculation that you would need 18 to 20% annual growth to deal with the debt must, uh, it, um, must assume uh, that the economy actually isn't growing. Because as long as the economy grows, that denominator is going to expand. So that absolute debt number, as long as the debt doesn't grow as fast as the economy, should shrink as a proportion of the economy and therefore make it serviceable. And then if you have financial deepening, you can spread it out. You can roll over the loans or turn them into bonds, recapitalize banks. There's a lot of ways. There's still a lot of places to put these funds. Um, in, 1990, in the late 1990s, uh, they were worried about the banks and they recapitalized the banks, created the asset management companies, and that dealt with that. So I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to say that this isn't my view, but there is that view. I don't think that these folks who have this position are necessarily Pollyannish. Uh, let me just go back here. Um, I think another issue that hasn't been discussed as much is to what extent is the, Bob, Bob hinted at it a little bit, but to what extent is the slowdown now simply a structural slowdown where, there, where we're heading in a one direction because of these real structural problems that are holding the economy back and pushing it in one direction, and to what extent is, is this cyclical? Uh, and I think to some extent, the, those who take a more san sanguine view would say that there's some cyclical elements to this, uh, maybe Chinese-style austerity, the anti-corruption measures in some ways are a austerity measure that if you relax them or have people adapt their behavior to them, you will then see a revival of growth. Uh, and they will then be able to make the investments and choices uh, with, with less, less danger. Um, in addition, you've got global slowdown, global commodity prices dropping, which to, for some aren't, aren't a product of China's slowdown, but just as a glut of, of the producers in iron ore. You've got the iron ore providers trying to run the Chinese iron ore providers out of business, so they're just producing to try and bring the price down to put the Chinese out of business. The Chinese haven't been out of business. So, uh, so that's part of the slowdown, is potentially part of the reason we have uh, slow growth now. In terms of growth potential, that wasn't, uh, I think the, the pessimists don't see a lot of chance for future growth because of the debt overhang, the lack of innovation amongst Chinese companies. Um, those who have a slightly more, po who have a more positive view, see lots of places where China can grow, uh, and the, the the idea that China has already picked all the low-hanging fruit on growth, for growth, these people would say, no, there's still a lot of things. You still have uh, urbanization, the movement of people off farms into cities, uh, irrespective of whether it's to fulfill some government priorities, or but there's still a lot of folks in agriculture. Uh, who could work and your productivity, labor productivity immediately goes up when you do that, as well as when you move into services. Uh, HUCO reform, which uh, the Chinese are in the midst of, uh, of implementing, ought to lead to also uh, greater improvement in allocation of, of labor resources. Uh, China's retirement age is now still relatively low, 60 for men, 55 or 50 for women, depending on where they work. You can just simply up the retirement ages and you've got more people in the labor, labor pool. Um, reforms in, uh, to the energy prices, competition, allowing more S, uh, private companies into sectors dominated by SOEs. These are all relatively straightforward policies uh, or trends that could be adopted, which could still generate growth uh, for a pretty significant amount of time. And, and then the last issue has to do with the seriousness of the reform efforts. And, it seems to me that there's, this, there's this, still this debate, and it's partly because China's politics is so opaque and hard to read, that uh, is, is Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, are they doing this just to pr protect their patronage network and keep themselves in power? Or do they have serious policy goals? Uh, and that <coughs> the, the, the lack of, the limits of implementation so far are a result of those vested interests that they haven't been able to overcome yet. Um, and so they're, and they're trying to do so many things at one time that really what we need to look at as a 10-year reform program instead of measuring it after just the first three years. So I think those are the areas where there's debate and differences that divide these camps. Um, and it's not really, again, and it, it's not clear to determine who's, who's right. Um, you know, um, pro wrestlers 
aren't aeronautical engineers. And when you build a plane and you put it up in the sky, if, it's, if it doesn't work, it's going to crash. Right? You, uh, economists or people that write about the economy, we don't have that problem. Um, we don't partic usually say we're, you know, go long on China, go short on China. Usually our analysis, and particularly with the people that we deal directly with, are about a specific sector, specific part of the country, a, a very narrow range of time, or the currency. And there you can apply a whole variety of different types of analyses and come up with uh, very smart and wise investment choices that say there's going to be problems here, uh, that's how you should invest, or there's going to be growth in this area. And uh, people offering those different advice at the same time are both right. The evidence shows both their planes all fly, uh, even though they're flying according to different, different appro approaches in engineering. Um, so um, I think it's a hard debate. I think my job has been to say that uh, we don't know. Um, at least there's not consensus. Um, and maybe the, the question is, in, and I guess if I was going to leave with one question, it would be, what would it take, uh, what type of evidence would you need to see, uh, uh, Anne, so that your, your picture of, of the economy and the trajectory would change? And then what would be the most negative type of things, would you have to see a financial crisis, Bob, before you would uh, admit that there isn't potential in the economy? Uh, so I think trying to, you know, the, the best social science or best analysis always tries to identify, you know, under what situation would I be proven wrong? Uh, and so why don't I stop there and uh, we can have more discussion. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Uh, I'd like to give Anne a chance to respond to both sets of comments and maybe answer that question. <laughs> yeah, maybe, me, Bob, you can answer a, that one, too. Let me give a quick response before we start talking with everybody. Um, you know, one, one thing, um, I, I'm, a, I'm really a stranger or a guest in the, in the world of finance, um, but it's, you know, those are my, that's my clientele, so that's something that I study and try to, try to get better at all the time. And there is one thing that I really like about finance, which is you're right or you're wrong. It's not a moral issue. Whether you know whether Tencent is a is a growing company, you know its, it's, it's share price is going to rise, or and Baidu's is going to fall. It's not a, it's not an ethical issue whether you like this model or that or that. You're right or you're wrong, and there are issues on which I've been right and issues on which I've been wrong in that world, and I think that we've prog progressed in China beyond the point where analysis of the economy is a matter of whether you have an intellectual framework that says I'm for the government or against it or I'm a China lover or China hater, I don't feel that I fit into a camp there at all. Of course I have my own prejudices. Um, but, um, you know, you, you could kind of push them this way or that way. Um, and, and I think that the characterization of, my, uh, of, of our economic, in my, proce in, in my company, uh, the, the processes that we go through is perhaps a little bit, um, a little bit too abstract. So let me stop at that, let, let me pause at that, that issue for a moment. Uh, for example, I, as to Bob's point, uh, you know, how do you decide which, which statistics to accept and which not to? You take the pessimistic ones you don't take. Not at all, not at all. Uh, I take the statistics that are most important to driving the economy. So steel is incredibly important. Cement is very important. Property is very important. Certain small things like, you know, the production of routers is not so important, so I don't pay so much attention to that. On steel, we, we, we have our own survey, our own pro proprietary survey that covers 35% of the production in the country. We conduct, it, uh, we conduct it every month, we pay the respondents, and we aggregate the results. We triangulate that against the CISA data, we look at, we, we purchase MySteel data, which provides you with a, a mill by mill output number. Uh, and we interview mills, of course, all the time. We check, uh, we check inventory at port. We look at import and export data. We have a very, very extensive data set on steel. And when I say that, that domestic demand fell by 4.8%, that's not, that's not because I'm just quoting a negative statistic. It happens that this last year, CISA came around finally and started to report a negative number. They came out at zero for the year because exports tripled. But domestically, they reported a down number. Now, that wasn't true through most of the year. But the way that they were doing it, by the way, was to change the base. 
So, uh, so, so they give a you know a month by month total of of steel production, and then they give a year to date total. And the month by month total and the year to date totals didn't add. So I can explain how that happens, but that was basically how they did it. NBS steel is higher for reasons that I could explain if you really want to be bored with the topic. But but these are not casual judgments. Now, I don't claim to be able to recreate China's GDP set, um, but, but it's not like I'm just cherry picking statistics. So that's uh, perhaps I overstress that point. Um, as for um, the, the 300 versus 200 percent, I revised the presentation to give you the more conservative number that is simply calculated from the NBS data, or actually the PBOC data. Um, I have my own number, which is, which is around 300 percent, and that's based on a calculation of debt held by different institutions. But that's a, that's a more difficult thing to use if you want to clear out the double counting. But I'm not simply adding 100 percent because I want to. So, uh, and, and it's informed by constantly talking to banks. So the, the distress that I'm discussing reflects the distress that I, that I hear from the economy all the time. So when I was walking around in 2010 and 2009, I would be sort of irritated and frustrated maybe by hearing all the banks talk about what a fantastic investment this new, this new zone was when clearly there was no real demand for it. But that was the case of the situation, you know, that was the situation, and I reported it, and it was a positive point of view. In 2011, things changed very dramatically, and I don't think you can find a bank, a developer, uh, an e-commerce vendor, a private company or a public company in China that is positive about its future, except in banking. Not in banking, but in, in shadow banking, which is an important <coughs> asterisk and it doesn't reflect something very positive about the long-term economy. Um, so, and as for the final point about private versus public, I would like to have that discussion with you. My personal view is that the Chinese reforms of the 1990s discovered um, one of the very important events or you know, emanations from those events was a way to, to make equity ownership unimportant in the economy in order to create institutions that would be able to operate in a more independent way to create more value and yet create beneficial cash flows for the state. I would submit to you that no organization gets above $10 million in gross revenues in China without having very important and ultimately very limiting backward links into the state. And I don't really care who technically owns what. I could, lay, I could tell you in some detail who's going to get cash out of the uh, maturation of shares in Alibaba in March, and it doesn't have much to do with who actually owns it. Hmm. So it, perhaps I'm being too vehement, but I was like, what? <laughs> you don't understand. I'm not just driving off roads. <laughs> so anyway, maybe we should go to the audience. <laughs> Bob, did you want to? Um, I, I think the question to me was, uh, what would it take for me to think things are really, really bad? Is that basically yeah. it? Um, Unemployment, basically. People out of work, uh, people going home, um, you know, uh, wages going down, that sort of thing. I mean, I think ultimately, I think even in this country, we, we tend to uh, focus too much on the numbers and not on the sort of standard of living, which is, after all, the point of economic, um, point of the economy. And so th I guess that's what I'd be looking for. I think, by the way, driving off the road is a great idea. I mean, the, the, when I was trying to do, and I talked to Ann about this story, when I was trying to do a story before the numbers made it clear that the housing was uh, um, uh, heading downward. So all the numbers were basically positive. And then you say to yourself, well, it's a, you know, the numbers are positive, whether you believe the numbers or not. And some of those numbers were from private, uh, private um, sources. And then you say to yourself, well, if I'm a Chinese reporter and I go to Detroit and I, you know, I say, well, I'm writing about America, it's part of America, but I mean, you wouldn't get a representative view. And China is so much more complicated and so much more diverse. And, and, but for me, I mean, uh, this is, um, uh, Ann and I are in the same ballpark, basically. It was, a, it was 
To me, it was that every single city I went to, for whatever reason, every single one was surrounded by empty apartment buildings. It was astonishing. And then at some point, you say to yourself, you know, the anecdotal is more important than the statistical. And so it's a problem in reporting in China. Great. Thanks. All right. Well, you've all been very patient, so I think we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, for standard CSIS procedure, please identify yourself and do confine your question to a question rather than a soliloquy and wait for the microphone to arrive. Um, right over here. Thanks. I'm uh, Tom Reckford uh, with the Foreign Policy Discussion Group. I'd like to have the panelists explore some of more of the political ramifications of what clearly is a slowdown. Uh, there's been a suggestion that unemployment is the key thing to watch. Uh, for many, many years, the conventional wisdom has been that the political legitimacy of the communist leadership depends on two things, nationalism and rapid economic growth. Clearly, we're not getting rapid economic growth anymore. When does this change be begin to affect the government's ability to keep control politically? Anyone? <laughs> I mean, it's not my specialty. It's much more, much more yours. But my, my view is that the idea that, uh, that, that social instability is an issue in, in Chinese politics is much overstated. I think that if ultimately that there's a, uh, a political event in China and even the collapse of the Communist Party, it comes from the bureaucracy, it comes from within, from the people who have the ability to organize and the incentive to do so and the ability to create a structure to replace what they displace. Um, I think that the idea of, you know, the, the legitimacy resting on economic, I think that's a little too filmy for people to, to really, um, you know, I, I do think that what's going on now does not have, it clearly doesn't have anything to do, I mean, it has something to do, it has very little to do with corruption. If the focus were on eradicating corruption, clearly the response would be legal reform and structural reform. That's never been on the table, it's never been of interest. I think the fact, the, the attacks on Minchung Bank Haitong Securities, Beijing Bank, Founder Securities, uh, now possibly Unicom, and so on and so forth. These indicate that uh, that the, that it's become so important to capture resources. That's my view of the core core value of this: capturing resources. I know that's controversial, but that's become so important that that the political system is willing to jettison a lot of international faith. And that, that provides portfolio capital. And that's, that's a warning sign. And I do think that things are, are getting much worse. Hmm. Uh, I, I would simply add that, that you know, I think some years ago there was an iron rule that if, if growth fell below 8%, there would be you know, massive chaos. Didn't happen. <laughs> and uh, now below 7% most likely and hasn't happened. I mean, one thing that is interesting is the government's own emphasis on employment. Uh, and uh, when you think about the demographic and structural changes that are happening, you would think they would be less concerned about this over time, right? Uh, in, in fact, if they were so worried about it, why aren't they building more shoe factories and you know, things like that, right, to employ a lot of people? So my sense is this is part and parcel of the broader debate, you know, Xi Jinping has announced that there is a new normal in the economy. Uh, I think consistent with some of the things Anne's been saying, my perception is that now the real fight among those that matter in the system is how do we define what the new normal is, because that will help separate the winners and losers uh, out of what comes next. Next. Right here up in the front. So I think just one second. Thank you. My name is Hai Bing. Now I'm visiting scholars in the CSIS. I have two questions. The first is about risk. I do uh, agree with the panelist an analysis on the China's economy performance. And no matter it's negative or positive, this is the reality of the China's economy. So from your observations, what looks likely the biggest risk for the China's economy in the 2015? My second question is about the new measures of the reform and opening. As we know that in the 2015, China is planning for our 13 five years plan. 
So it is a very critical year. Now the President Xi mentioned, uh, put forward the idea of the new Silk Road strategy and also Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone reform. So from your observations, if like you give suggestion to the China's government, what do you think China should do, must do in the following five years in the opening and the reforming measures? Thank you. Go right ahead, Scott. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Um, um, I think, you know, I, I think, you know, as much as there is a difference of opinion from the different observers, um, I think most would agree that, that, that the debt problem is the most risky problem. Um, and that um, if there are enough defaults or folks want their money out of multiple banks all at the same time, or uh, there's problems using the foreign exchange reserves to deal with problems or print money, that, um, and since, since crises are as much psychological as material, uh, that you, you, there's not a 100% guarantee that the government could, could keep it in the box and that there, there is a possibility of, of a crisis. I think given the, the government's uh, toolbox, toolkit, the relatively very small percentage of debt that is foreign, um, the, uh, the low fiscal deficit that the government has, uh, its ability simply to, to shut the bank's doors, um, uh, that I think that's a very low probability, but it's still possible, and it's, it's the one that probably keeps uh, you know, folks in the PBOC and elsewhere in Zhongnanhai uh, most concerned. Um, I have a couple. So um, the way I sort of think about this is things that are beyond the ability of the government to control. Mm -hmm. And so one is the housing uh, problems. Is it, have they gotten to the point where people think housing is a really terrible investment mm. and that they aren't going to buy housing. Mm. And that, um, I mean, you saw that's what happened here and uh, it sort of ricocheted through the economy. It's, it's a different economy, a different structure, but once people's attitudes change, it's really hard to get them uh, to change back um, and, and it can take quite some uh, time. Another thing is, at some point, presumably, they're going to let something significant go broke, and uh, they will try that as a, you know, as a, as a test case, you know, to see, uh, to try to warn people that uh, not everything's guaranteed, and that can go really quite badly. Um, uh, it's kind of the equivalent of, you know, the Fed uh, raising interest rates when it should be lowering it, and sort of creating a, a recession. Um, and then the third, and this is kind of overreaction, so the capital outflows. Do the leaders free, basically freak out? Mm. I mean, do they, let's say they do have 3.8 trillion and they lose 200 billion or whatever it is. Not that much, but they really get nervous because the way in which the reserves are viewed is as a national, it's silly, but it's sort of a national treasure as opposed to something you use. And so if that were to happen, will they pull back enormously on any sort of you know, efforts to open the economy or further open the economy or reform? Me? <laughs> Look, I'm a structure person, not a, not a person person. I, I, I believe that what the Chinese government does or doesn't do is not very relevant. And I think uh, the idea that, that you know, this that spending money to drive exports to Central Asia uh, and, you know, by the way, getting all these strategic benefits out of it, I think that's, it, it just is irrelevant, essentially. It's irrelevant to the economy, too. So you can think of lots of relevance for particular companies and for particular strategic goals, but fundamentally, and I also feel that we have, we have a, many years of training in thinking that, that there's a, a a concurrence between what the Chinese government says and what happens. Mm -hmm. And this is because, uh, largely because of the control of information, which has been very, very, very successful. I think we need to recognize that the, that the Chinese government is actually quite an antiquated ruling structure uh, or a system, political system. Their ability to achieve goals is very limited. 
Um, and one of the, 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 the principal goal that the Chinese government is able to achieve economically is investment. That's it. There are no other goals if you can think through, you know, rebalancing or, you know, or environment or, you know, whatever other goals have been articulated, the interna internationalization of the renminbi, blah, blah, blah. the other goals that have been articulated over the decades, nothing that's, that's not accomplished with capital investment has ever been achieved because that's, those are the measures that they have to hand. And the problem with the economy right now is that capital investment is not the answer. Mm. So I believe that the central government, there are political things that can go very wrong. There are ways to manage the monetary system that can be mistakes. Um, but I think the idea that they pull this lever to try to slow things down and pull that lever to speed things up is simply the wrong option. I think actually their hands are more and more tied and there's not very much that they can do. As for the key risk to the economy, it's bank failure. Mm. Okay, um, right here in the, in the front. Uh, Bob Vastine, uh, Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Um, Dr. Kennedy, you mentioned uh, services. And I'm aware, having sp spent some time in the services sector, that uh, Chinese leadership has, over the past several years, very um, grandly announced that they were going to shift the proportion of the economy from about 40% services to something a good deal higher. Um, the Chinese have, have underperformed the rest of the world on, on creating services jobs and building their services sector. And uh, Dr. Young, you just said governments can't do anything about it. But I'm wondering if there has been any progress um, over the last year or two since um, major announcements were made on uh, increasing the, the, the economic, economic activity in the services sector, jobs, and thus bringing more stability. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, I guess one of the, the first po points I was, when I brought up services, uh, and this gets to a point that Anne raised, and uh, in, in the type of data, uh, is the, you know, a lot of the physical measures are the ones um, that, uh, she works very hard to measure and that others look at apply to the industrial economy. Um, and over a longer period of time, services has become a growing share of the economy. Um, and so we'll need other types of measures to see whether there's slowdowns in, in that that are equal to the industry side. Um, you know, and services have continued to grow. Uh, private sector has continued to grow. Um, and I, can, I would expect to see continued gradual improvement. I would agree uh, with Ann that you, you can't, in one policy swoop, change, it, change the radical course. But there have been, poli you know, they've talked about liberalizing education to allow more private schools, um, health care to have more private hospitals, um, and other types of liberalization in financial services. Uh, and those are policy measures which uh, they have taken small steps on, which they could take much larger steps on. Um, so uh, I would, m my own expectation is to continue to see that purport, the services as a proportion of the overall economy continue to grow. Um, and as long as there isn't the financial crisis that's generated by bank failure, um, to, to not see uh, to, to continue to, to, to see that as progress in the economy, whether, you know, it's comparing the structure of the Chinese economy to the structure of the American economy or most European economies really doesn't make sense, given that their per capita GDP is 6,000 per year and ours is 40 to 50,000 per year. And of course, we're gonna have much greater services uh, as a proportion of our economy. But the trend has been, is, is relatively clear. Um, so I, I don't see anything which should suggest that we're gonna move uh, back towards greater industry or agriculture as a part of the economy. Anything <laughs> to add? <laughs> no, you're good? Okay, mm -hmm. Matt Goodman. <clears throat> Matthew Goodman here at CSS. I can trump Scott because I've actually known Ann Stevenson for 40 years <laughs> uh, since we were in high school and this is the first time we've seen each other, <laughs> seen each other in 40 years, so good That's to see you, Ann. Cool. Uh, <laughs> that, that's right. Um, so, 
it seems to me a lot of people have gone broke predicting that you know China was going to collapse over the last 35 years. So it seems to me the burden of proof is on people who say, who, to show, who think it's uh, declining or there's a problem, to show what's changed and what's different. And one thing is that by their own assertion, they have to move, and you've just uh, suggested again, and they have to move from an investment-led uh, uh, model of growth to one based more on uh, consumption domestic uh, and other forms of domestic demand. Um, and that seems to me means that they have to uh, have better resource allocation and a financial system that is more geared towards that model, which means they have to have financial liberalization, uh, including interest rate deregulation and all the other things that come along with uh, you know, deeper liquid capital markets, more open capital accounts. Uh, and all of that seems to me raises, I mean, is likely to raise the, the interest rate structure in the economy, and that seems to me poses a huge risk. So I wondered if people could comment on that and how, you, how they manage that uh, transition. The other thing is more of a political economy question, which is that, um, you know, the system to date and the old model was all based on one objective, growth, and everybody was lined up behind that objective, and all the incentives were directed towards that objective. Uh, and now you have multiple objectives because people want some growth and rising incomes, but they also want you know clean air, they want clean government, they want their trash taken out, they want all kinds of things that people want in a more uh, pluralized uh, system. So um, the question is, how do you incentivize you know the people, the actors, the local officials, the local state-owned enterprise um, officials to pursue these multiple objectives in a way that, you know, keeps, keeps growth moving forward but addresses all these other concerns. Fantastic questions. You want me to take the first, sure. first hit there because there's a lot to say about them. But I, I would say as to the first question, you're absolutely right. They, everybody talked about, you know, the exciting new bank liber liberalization that would ensue uh, back when Xi Jinping's government took over in early 2012 or in late 2012. It was clear, as many of many of us so-called pessimists were saying, it was clear that there was only one direction for interest rates, which is down. Mm. And that has occurred. And until you deal with the elephant in the room, which is the debt, you can't have bank liberalization because the banks are, I mean, the, there, there's a fiction that the banks are actually solvent because you have this massive, massive load of stuff that has to be constantly rolled over. So, so that's the problem. Um, and there's a lot of debate over what could happen if they went through a 2002 event, you know, 98 to 2002 event again, whether that's possible, I would be pessimistic about that, but at any rate, that has to happen before the banks can, can liberalize. As to, um, uh, what was the second part? I forgot. Uh, incentives. incentives. Yeah, how do you right, realign incentives, incentives in the system. away from growth? Um, I mean, that's... There are a lot of answers to that. I think the simplest is the political, because as we're all, I think as you all are aware here, uh, the, the key structural event post-1989 was a restructuring of the relationship between, of, among the five levels of government, very specifically and deliberately undertaken in order to strengthen the central government's ability to hold the country together, hmm. knowing that there was a significant cost and there was a significant cost to the economy and to the culture and to the future of China, but that was a cost that was willingly undertaken because of the concern that China would fragment. Now we're in a situation where local governments are responsible for the great majority of costs and for social services and have no ability to raise their own budgets mm. and taxes. So that's why we have the land issue. Mm -hmm. That's why the, it's, 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 it's one of the you know, three key reasons why we had, why we had the housing expansion in, in 2006. And you can't get away from that unless you give local <coughs> governments, the, unless you collapse the five levels of government to maybe three, and you give the local governments the ability to raise capital. That weakens the center, and that's clearly not on the table. Governor Scott? Um, to me, on the second, uh, the second issue, so the multiple um, objectives, I think there are sort of two ways around it. One, which they're trying, uh, 
uh, telling officials uh, that they'll be judged on multiple objectives. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's not just growth that will get you a promotion. Um, doesn't seem to be doing very much at the moment, but, but that's what they're trying to do, to, you know, to give them a scale of uh, things to be judged on. But GDP, whether you believe the numbers or not, GDP at least is a number. How do you, I mean, if you're in Hebei surrounding Beijing, I mean, how do you legitimately say to them, you know, your pollution readings have to go down? It's not exactly under your control very much. The other one is step back, you know? I mean, privatize. Uh, you know, the, the, these are the state-owned companies. Uh, they have multi, they have two masters, right? They have a political master and then they have a corporate master. Well, remove the political master as much as you possibly can. They do talk about that, but um, again, that's quite a, would be quite a leap. Um, I agree, focusing on growth is obviously uh, a, a much more simpler goal when you just have that one growth, one target. Um, you know, um, you know I don't, I'm not a big believer in modernization theory per se, uh, but I do think in the, 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 the time that I've been going to China and interacting with Chinese since the 80s, that I have seen value changes in, in Chinese and in, in what they think is important um, overall. And obviously making incomes and originally wanting to have a refrigerator and a bicycle and your, you know, an apartment and, and over time and wanting to have more material wealth is, is true. But Chinese are also interested in a lot of other things. Um, uh, a, a cleaner environment, uh, quality education for their, for their families. Um, and I think that these things gradually work their, their way up uh, and through the system. They're parts of the discussions in the media. Um, you know, China doesn't have uh, a powerful civil society, but does have a civil society and nonprofit groups, uh, many of which uh, are genuine grassroots organizations that promote these type of values. Uh, and that you see that in the surveys that are done by groups uh, in China like Horizon and others. And give, although this isn't a government which is directly accountable through votes, uh, to people. They do pay attention to these polls and the Communist Party itself does a lot of surveys. Uh, and I was really struck by the uh, greater attention over the last couple years to air pollution. Uh, and that was not something that the Chinese central government wanted there to be a focus on. That was a product of popular views uh, individually and through groups. Uh, and, there was, and partly uh, the U.S. Embassy using its control of its sovereign territory on the Asian continent to have this uh, uh, measure, which everyone could read. Um, but that has now become uh, and now a, a high priority for the Chinese government. Um, and you know, I like to see. I don't like to see China as a snapshot in time. I like to see it as a moving picture. And we are in the midst of this movie that's being made. Uh, and so obviously the, the air quality index looks horrible uh, now. Um, Pittsburgh's air quality used to look horrible. Um, and if you go to Pittsburgh now, uh, I wouldn't because it's too cold. <laughs> but if I did, uh, the air is much better. Uh, and you know, so I, I think as, the, as we watch this movie unfold, uh, it is more complicated to have more diverse targets um, to some extent. Uh, and that will be hard for this uh, political system to make uh, to implement. But you also have other sources of ideas and activity, uh, which will, which I think is gradually turning this this ship. Okay. Well, we're just about at time, so uh, I appreciate everyone joining me and thanking the panel, uh, and thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.